Hey guys, it's Kaylee, and welcome back to Pina Suit, where I talk about sustainability because I dream of a world where each year isn't the new hottest year on record. Hello everyone and Happy New Year. I cannot believe how quickly 2024 flew by and that we have already entered 2025. I have to admit that it is a little strange being in 2025. When I was a young university student engaged in climate change issues, we'd often hear that we needed certain emissions reductions by 2025, and at that time it really felt forever away. Yet here we already are, and just as predicted back in those days, a lack of climate action is resulting in real consequences including bigger floods, hotter heat waves, stronger hurricanes, all of which we saw this year. In fact, the UN just published a report saying 2024 was indeed the hottest year on record and that the top 10 hottest years of all time were in the last decade. And unfortunately, this year was not very encouraging on the sustainability front. 2024 was marked by rising geopolitical tensions and a number of conflicts that have rightly taken much of the global community's attention. In addition, in 2024, a record number of people, approximately 4 billion in more than 50 countries, went to the polls to choose new leadership. And while there were some bright spots among those elections, like a climate scientist being elected in Mexico and France rejecting the far right, some key geographies, namely the US and the European Union, did make a notable shift to the right, which many anticipate will set back progress on sustainability right at a time when bold action is needed the most. So with that unfortunately somewhat depressing introduction, I present you my annual tradition of looking back at the big sustainability moments of the previous year. So without further ado, let's dive in. For me, this year revolved around a number of large multilateral meetings and negotiations mostly related to environmental issues, but not only. In 2024, all the UN conventions of the Rio Earth Summit, which are climate, biodiversity, and desertification, held their Conference of the Parties, or COPs, as you probably have heard them called. In addition, the global community struggled with negotiations on its Global Plastics Treaty, and the UN Secretary General held his anticipated Summit of the Future. Interestingly, most of these things took place in the second half of the year, so the first part of 2024 was relatively slow on the global front. Where we did see some movement on sustainability in the first part of the year was in the EU. Lawmakers anticipated a shift to the right in the June elections, and therefore they scrambled to pass a groundbreaking regulation for corporations just before that. This regulation that was adopted is called the CSDDD, or the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, and it introduces new obligations for companies on identifying and managing adverse impacts on human rights and the environment. The CSDDD complements the EU's other significant regulation for corporates focused on reporting, which is called the CSRD, or the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which was adopted back in 2023. I think you can think of these two pieces of regulation a little bit like ex ante and ex post. The CSDDD asks companies to ensure that they're being good corporate citizens in their planning and their strategies and when executing operations, whereas the CSRD asks companies to report on their activities related to environmental and social performance to enhance overall transparency. The EU really is known for being a leader on sustainability regulation, so when they implement things like this, it is worth paying attention to. For example, they published a taxonomy on sustainable activities back in 2020, and since then, 47 taxonomies have come into effect or are under development in other countries. The CSDDD did require some watering down to get it over the finish line for it to be passed, but it is one of the most progressive pieces of corporate sustainability regulation on the planet. Interestingly, the EU also tried to put another piece of sustainability regulation into effect in 2024, the EUDR or the EU deforestation regulation. This will require companies that produce or use certain commodities like cattle, cocoa, coffee, oil, palm, rubber and soya and wood to do additional due diligence to ensure that they are not contributing to deforestation. However, in November, the EU Parliament officially delayed this regulation by one year, meaning it should come into effect at the end of December 2025. 
One of my favorite sustainability moments of the year took place in April when the Swiss Climate Grannies won the first ever climate case victory at the European Court of Human Rights. The court case was put forward by over 2,000 senior women in Switzerland, and the judgment states that Switzerland is violating the human rights of older women because the state is not taking the necessary steps to combat global warming. This creates a legal basis for linking climate change to human rights, which has a lot of international legal significance. It was truly one of the bright spots in a mostly disappointing year for sustainability. 2024 was set to be an important year in the global negotiations to limit plastic pollution. The negotiations began back in 2022, and there were two important meetings scheduled in 2024 to work towards a global agreement. One in April in Ottawa, Canada, and another that was meant to be the final one in November in Busan, Korea. Unfortunately, the negotiations were fraught with challenges and the media went so far as to call the negotiations in Korea a total collapse. The breakdown of the negotiations was due mostly to a few countries, including Iran, India, China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, who refused to accept a treaty that would include any time-bound numerical targets to reduce virgin plastics production levels even with a targeted focus on chemicals and items which are the hardest to recycle or the most harmful to human and animal health. Ultimately, negotiators were forced to push any decision on a global agreement to 2025. In September, at the UN General Assembly, the Secretary General convened the Summit of the Future. The summit was touted as an effort to save and reinvigorate multilateralism and focused on forging a new international consensus on delivering a better present and safeguarding the future. UN member states did adopt a pact for the future, which included chapters on sustainable development, financing for development, international peace and security, science, technology, innovation, and digital cooperation, and youth and future generations, as well as transforming global governance. I'm probably being a little cynical, but to me and many others, this summit ultimately felt like a failure and another talk shop for world leaders to say things that don't really get put into practice. Sure, it produced a document with some words on paper, but that means little when multilateral institutions have been un unable to do anything to prevent and stop massive conflicts that we see in Ukraine and Gaza or to halt climate change or prevent nature loss or to safeguard human rights. Ultimately, I believe this summit will be nothing but a footnote in history. After the UN General Assembly and the Summit for the Future, a busy autumn season kicked off for all three of the Rio conventions. In October, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity convened their 16th COP in Cali, Colombia. In November, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change held its 29th COP in Baku, Azerbaijan. And finally, in December, the UN Convention to Combat Desertification held its 16th COP in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. It was a bit of a mixed bag when it came to outcomes of these COPs, so let's go over some of the key things we saw at each one. Starting with biodiversity, there were two significant outcomes out of the Cali COP. First, parties agreed to enhance the role of Indigenous people and local communities in the Biodiversity Convention. Specifically, they adopted a program of work called Article 8J that embeds the rights, contributions, and technical knowledge of Indigenous peoples and local communities into the global agenda. They also established a new permanent subsidiary body for IPLC, which is the Indigenous People and Local Communities, and recognized the role of people of African descent in implementing the convention and in the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. The second large outcome was that governments also agreed to establish a new global fund called the Cali Fund, which is dedicated to sharing the benefits derived from using Digital Sequence Information, or DSI, from genetic resources. The fund will require a certain percentage of profits to be contributed by organizations that benefit commercially from the use of DSI. This includes pharmaceutical, biotechnology, animal and plant breeding companies. These funds will then support developing countries in biodiversity protection and regeneration. Unfortunately, discussions around the establishment of a new, wider biodiversity fund were postponed which was very disappointing because there was a target of mobilizing 200 billion annually by 2030 to implement the global biodiversity framework. Moving to climate, COP29 was rife with controversy from the very beginning as it was reported that fossil fuel deals were being done on the sidelines by the host country and other fossil fuel producing nations. Despite this disappointing dimension of the meeting, there were two main outcomes that were reached. 
First, countries agreed to a new finance goal to replace the current 100 billion by 2030 goal, and the new one is at least 300 billion per year from developed countries by 2030. Second, a breakthrough finally happened around carbon market rules. Parties agreed on the carbon market rules underpinning both bilateral carbon trading and centralized crediting mechanisms. Finally, with desertification, the goal of the COP was to reach an agreement on drought, but unfortunately that did not happen. But the COP did end in the launch of the Riyadh Action Agenda, a platform which aims to mobilize action from countries to conserve and restore 1.5 billion hectares of land globally by 2030. In addition, pledges of $12.15 billion were made to the Riyadh Global Drought Resilience Partnership to support 80 of the world's most vulnerable countries in tackling drought resilience. And that will close us out for 2024. I hope you enjoyed this pretty short summary of the big moments for sustainability in 2024. I have to say I am bracing myself for 2025 as I think everyone who works in this space is. I think we're all assuming that the Trump presidency is going to set sustainability back and particularly the Paris Climate Agreement, but let's all remain optimistic and keep pushing for the action that we know is needed. And now I'm going to close out, but I wanted to take a quick moment to thank you so much for supporting Hippie in a Suit for another year. In January 2024, I did get a pretty big promotion at work, which meant I had a lot less capacity to make videos this year. In fact, I was pretty horrified to see that I'd only published two videos in 2024. However, I have been so touched that people continue to consume my content despite my slower activity. And with where my professional life is right now, I don't really anticipate that I'll be able to do so much content publishing in 2025, but I do plan to finally finish my SDG series. I know it's been a long time coming and to continue making videos when I think there's something important to talk about or if there's an issue or topic that others need explained. So if there's anything you're confused about or you want more information about, don't hesitate to let me know in the comments. As always, thank you so much for being here. If you learned something in this video, give it a like, and don't forget to check out the blog post if you want more information on the big milestones of 2024. I wish you all a very happy new year. See you in the next one, and until then, keep fighting the good fight. Bye!